In memory of Zoe Campos, listeners suggested I republish the episode Unfound aired the summer of 2018, five months before her remains were found in the backyard of the house where Carlos Rodriguez lived at the time Zoe disappeared. What you will be hearing is the original episode with an updated to January 2019 news section, along with additional commentary by myself at the end after the original one. As you listen, please keep Zoe's family in your thoughts and prayers. Zoe Gabrielle Campos was an 18-year-old from Lubbock, Texas. She was close to her family and loved to work on cars. On the night of November 17, 2013, Zoe was at home with her sister and a friend. After they went to bed, Zoe seemingly left to meet a guy who was introduced to her earlier that day. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. If you watch the Unfound Facebook Live show every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, you know I reveal a lot more about my background, my past, than I would ever do on the episodes every Friday. Well, I don't remember if the following information has ever come up on the live show, but I'll say it right now. And yes, this is relevant to this episode's case. But I'm a teetotaler. I don't drink alcohol now and haven't for several years. In fact, I've never been drunk in my life or even had a buzz. Why? Really not sure. It's not a religious thing or anything like that. I just never got into it. I suppose it helps that I continue to remember my hatred for the taste of wine and beer and whiskey, etc., 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 when I did imbibe once in a while back in the day. I can go further to say I've never done any illegal or socially acceptable drugs either. Marijuana? Nope. Ecstasy? Never. Mushrooms? Nada. Once again, It's just not me. I don't necessarily take any huge pride in it. Truthfully, I don't think about that fact of my life much at all. However, I do feel sometimes like it's a detriment in analyzing some of these cases where drugs and alcohol are involved. Not that I ever plan to change my ways, but I can't rely on my 47 years of experience to get in the head of someone else who has done those things. So for Zoe's case... I'm going to have to rely on some of you and your experience instead. I bring this up because on the night of Zoe's disappearance, she reached out to someone, someone she knew very well, maybe for help, for advice, for diversion, and was on the phone with this person for almost a half hour. Yet, this person cannot remember the conversation. Why? Because he was drunk, Zoe says. If we only knew what happened during their talk we might be able to solve Zoe's disappearance if we could only find somewhere in this man's mind a lost call. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Goodsight, charlieproject.org. In the months leading up to Zoe's disappearance, she had broken up with a boy her family approved of to date a guy who had much more of a turbulent background. This relationship quickly became on again, then off again. All the while, though, Zoe was taking care of her business. She worked hard and saved up enough money to buy her own car, a 1997 Lincoln. It had some damage, but using her own skills, Zoe planned to fix it. On the day of November 17, 2013, she first went to see a longtime friend's new baby. After that, Zoe went to dinner with her sister Savannah and her children and a friend, Jessica. They then went home to watch movies and relax. It was a normal Sunday by all accounts. Around 11.30 p.m., the others went to bed, thinking Zoe would be doing the same very shortly. The next day, Savannah and Jessica woke up to find Zoe wasn't there. In addition, they discovered Zoe had texted her mother to say she could pick her up at work at 2.30 a.m., but Zoe never arrived. Her vehicle was found three days later, but not before a man was seen driving it, but he escaped after ditching the Lincoln in an apartment complex. Zoe was never seen again. 
Since then, many facts about Zoe's travels on the early morning of November 18th have been discovered, but they only seem to cloud the picture of what happened. They include a half-hour phone call from Zoe to a family friend that the friend doesn't remember, a young man who Zoe went to meet who changed his story about seeing her, and an alleged sighting of Zoe at a motel that some people believe, but others don't, on the night-slash-morning she disappeared. Zoe's family believes foul play caused her to go missing. The case remains unsolved. The guest for this episode is Melinda Campos, Zoe's mother. Unfound news for January 11th, 2019. The next unfound newsletter will be coming out in a few days. Please look for it. It should be considerably longer and more detailed than December's due to me now getting back into the full swing of things since my mother's death. If you've never received the newsletter, please contact me privately at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com and I'll put you on the email list. Next, the Wednesday Night Live show has moved to YouTube and I can say it's already a success. We automatically doubled the viewership. I hope for that to expand as we get further into 2019. Have you watched it yet? If not, you should. Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern on the Unfound YouTube channel. Finally, speaking of the YouTube channel, I'm slowly getting caught up on posting the older episodes with pictures to the channel. I think I'm only about 12 episodes behind, which truly isn't very many. Barring any issues, we should be all caught up there within the next week. Thanks. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. This week I need to thank Stacy and Whitney. You can also contribute to PayPal, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. That is also the email address. The website, unfoundpodcast.com. Merchandise, the books at Amazon.com in both ebook and print form. Don't forget the reviews. Shirts at MyShopify.com. Cards at MakePlayingCards.com. And please mention Unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thanks. I'm so fortunate to have on this episode of Unfound the mother of Zoe Campos, Melinda Campos. Melinda, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's start here. Tell the listeners a little bit about Zoe. And in fact, you have two daughters, don't you? Yes, I do have two daughters. Uh, Savannah is my oldest and Zoe is my youngest. She was my baby. And how many years uh, separate uh, your two daughters? And how old uh, is Savannah and how old is Zoe now? Uh, it's a five-year difference uh, between their ages, and uh, Savannah is 20, 27, and Zoe will, uh, this September will be 24, 25. Okay. No. Sorry, sorry to put you on I'm the sorry. spot for that. <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot. She's going to... That's okay. She's going to be 22, 23. Okay. All right. So Savannah and are separated by about five years. But uh, mm-hmm. in talking to you, I, I got the idea that Zoe was a, a very unique uh, young woman. Her hobbies, her interests, uh, those things. Why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, Zoe was – Zoe's a – she's – She's very smart, very um, direct. Uh, she likes um, her hobbies include like she likes to go fishing. She loves fishing. She likes being outdoors. Um, she likes dogs, well, animals, all kinds. Every time I would come home, there would be a different stray at the house, and mm. like just she just loved animals, and uh, she wanted to go to school to become a mechanic. She liked old cars and the fact of fixing them up and, and, and just working on them. That was, that was her. She was, she was a character. She really was. She really is. Um, she's, uh, she was very funny. 
very clumsy. Um, the biggest heart, but if you, she did have a little temper. So <laughs> if you made her mad, <laughs> watch out. That was it. That was it. She was, she was five one and probably like a hundred pounds. And, uh, but she was, she was very, very tough. She could hold her own. No, there was just a lot of times where, you know, um, things happened in life and, she was the one that was protecting like her sister when she was pregnant or, or me, like if someone was being rude to me at a store or something, she would be the one right there. Just, just, uh, being really vocal. <laughs> uh -huh. I have to ask you being that, uh, I mean, my impression, I mean, I'm 47 years old, but my impression, uh, is that, uh, not too many women get into fixing cars, although there are m many women who are into cars, absolutely, but actually working on them, fixing them up. Uh, were you kind of amazed the first time you ever saw like a wrench in Zoe's hand that she said she was going to oh work on God. a car or something? Yes. Yes. I was like, because she was the, the daintiest, girliest girl. She loved, you know, makeup and clothes and jewelry and curling her hair and fixing her hair and she loved all of that and but yet a big part of her was like tomboyish like she had to you know be out there fishing with the boys or you know looking at old vehicles and just trying to see what she could do uh just she had that those qualities in her like she could be the girliest girl but yet she could you know, put on some sweatpants and a t-shirt and be, you know, mm -hmm. rugged, I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, she had a diverse, she had a diverse array of interests and talents. Yeah. She, she, and she's very smart. Uh, she did really good in school. It was just her, like grade wise. Um, it was just, she had a really big issue with teachers like, she always felt like she was being disrespected or talked down to. So I guess she had a problem with certain authority mm -hmm. figures. And so it, that ended up being that she didn't uh, graduate from high school. Did she get her equivalents on uh, degree then? Equivalent she, degree? She was working on it. She was going to uh, a charter, uh, like a, a school for her GD and all that. And, um, again, you know, she just became unfocused and wanted to do more things all at one time. And school was just not a big priority to her. And, um, let's talk about her, her father a little bit. What kind of relationship did she have with him? I understand that you two uh, eventually got divorced, but, uh, how was that relationship? Um, prior to, um, me and, and, and Alex getting divorced, uh, Zoe and he were, were inseparable. I mean, he, she pretty much had him wrapped around her little pinky. Um, it was everything that, um, you know, Zoe said or Zoe wanted, you know, he would do. And, and, and you know, he would still do it after we got divorced, but their relationship kind of, it didn't, it didn't like fade or anything like that. It was just more like she would started growing up more and she, he was away a lot. So, you know, that was, uh, that was a big, big thing in her life is the fact that he wasn't there on a daily basis. And so they kind of just, you know, they had a relationship, but not as, as close as, as they had when we were all just a big family. Okay. And how did you feel uh, about Zoe when she said that she was going to drop out of high school? Were you worried about that? I was very much worried. I was very upset. Uh, I mean, we had, we had several arguments about it. Um, I, I just, I, once she turned 18 and still wasn't, still hadn't graduated, there wasn't really a lot that I could do. I mean, I, I would 
wake her up and tell her, okay, let's go to school. I'm going to take you to school. And it just, um, there's, I, I guess, um, maybe on my part, I was too lenient with her or I didn't try hard enough. I just didn't want to, uh, upset her or argue with her or, you know, just have that relationship with her. Mm-hmm. But was she working? I mean, she didn't just drop out and sit around the house all the time. Did she get a job? What was she doing in that area of her life? Yeah, she she got a job. She became a hostess at a restaurant. And she was there every shift. Um, even if they, they needed her, she would go in. There was, there was plenty of times where she, like, worked a double. And she had complete control of that part of her life, like, money wise she Mm. you know she saved up her money and you know eventually bought her a vehicle and all on her own with her you know paying her cell phone bill paying her insurance doing you know what she needed to do uh buying things for the vehicle that she had just bought and gas and and she was very responsible with her money okay was she living with you at the time, what was the living situation between you and, and Zoe and then her uh, sister, Savannah? Were you all living together or separate? Or what was going on at the time um, of, her, of Zoe's disappearance? At the time of Zoe's disappearance, uh, she had been living with my, my other daughter, Savannah. She had been living with her for about, uh, about three months, three or four months. She had just moved back with her. I I was I wasn't living with them. I was I was in a different place. Um, but it was them two who originally got that apartment at the beginning, and then she moved out. And then once my oldest daughter needed her help, she came back to the apartment. Okay. So Zoe and Savannah were living together at the time. Um of Zoe's disappearance, and we'll we'll get into maybe that living situation a little bit later as to where Zoe was uh, that night. But you were living uh, by yourself, but your your daughters were living together. Correct. Okay. Was that close? Were they right down the street, or or what? Um, from their apartment to where I was at, uh, where I was living, it was it's probably about a ten minute drive. Um, it, it wasn't far, but you know, it wasn't just like down the street or the next block. No, but okay, it was it was it was it was pretty close. Pretty close for a decent sized city like Lubbock. Correct. Okay, tell the listeners maybe a little bit about a couple uh, young men that Zoe was dating. Uh, my impression was that you liked one of them, and then the other one you weren't so hot about. Maybe we can talk about, I mean, we are, anytime uh, a woman disappears, we end up t- talking about those men who were in her life. Why don't you tell the listeners about these two guys? You can just use their first names. Okay. Um, well, the first, uh, her first, like, serious boyfriend that she had was, his name was Joe. And uh, I actually knew, we knew Joe, I've known Joe since he was younger, um, we just kind of, you know, because I was military when I was married, um, uh, well, my, my ex is military. So we moved around a lot and, um, but we always knew their family and him. Um, it just so happened once, uh, Zoe got into her sophomore year, I believe, or her freshman year, uh, she got introduced to Joe, reintroduced to Joe and they started dating and they dated for a while uh i want to say two to three years and um i really liked him he he was a good he's a good kid he's he was very respectful uh his his family's very respectful um so i i really did like him um it's just both of them had high strong personalities so I think in the end, that's what caused their breakup. Mm-hmm. And uh, Zoe started dating another individual, another young man. Um, 
his name was Jacob and I, I didn't like him at all. It's just like a first impression, first instinct, like a, just an instinct that I had that I just, I just didn't care for him. I didn't like the way he, his personality was. I didn't like, and he wasn't ugly. It was just, he was, um, he was, he was real cocky and real arrogant. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that I just, I just didn't like, I just didn't like him. I just, I, I did it. (laughs) So Joe was around Zoe's age. Uh, was Jacob also around Zoe's age, or was she was he a little bit older? Uh, he uh, he was a little bit older than her. I think it was he was probably about two to three years older than her, and he already had kids, uh, a kid. So I think that was another factor to which I didn't like because of the fact that you know Zoe really just doesn't need to be she didn't need to be dating someone that already had a kid. That, that was just, you know, what I was thinking. Okay. Uh, would you say that Zoe and Jacob were an item at the time of her disappearance or had they break, broken things off before then? They had broken things off. Um, but I do believe they would still kind of text each other. Um, both of them were, uh, they, she was single at, at the time of her disappearance. She didn't have a boyfriend, but she would still keep in contact with Jacob. And I believe every once in a while she would talk to Joe, just, you know, hi, you know, how are you and stuff like that. Okay. We'll talk about uh, them maybe a little bit later in this conversation. Uh, one thing we, we are going to touch upon, and we are only talking about this because it could be an element of Zoe's disappearance. Uh, uh, we realize that the attitude toward marijuana use is changing in this country. A lot of states have legalized it and everything, but this could be something uh, that led to her disappearance. We're just not sure. Uh, my experience is that drugs, whether it's legal or illegal or somewhere in between, often do lead to disappearances. Once again, with this show that I do, Unfound, but if you could just shortly talk about uh, Zoe and her marijuana use. And once again, we're bringing this up because of what the last person who saw her says about the night that she disappeared. What can you tell listeners just shortly a little bit about that? Um, I never I never hit the fact that uh, Zoe did smoke marijuana. Um, that was always something that I was very honest about and could still continue to be honest about, did I, did I approve of it? No, no, I, I did not. Um, I, oh, I, I would tell her just don't, don't, um, don't be around people when that you don't know when you're smoking, because that it, it really does factor in like into your, your thoughts, your state of mind. And, um, that was the only thing that I ever, I, I ever asked of her. I just said, be honest with me and, 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 and tell me the truth about this stuff. And, um, like I said, I, I never, ever approved of her smoking, but, mm-hmm. you know, it was something that I, I mean, she was going to do it behind my back anyways. So I just rather have known than not know. All right. And it wasn't like she was living with you. She wasn't living under your roof. She was 18 years old. By most standards, she's an adult. Um, yeah, so what are you going to do? She had her right? own money. Yeah. Yeah, she had her own money. Yep. It was she wasn't asking me for money for it. So, you know, there really wasn't any way really to stop her. I mean, I could tell her till I was blue in the face, Zoe, don't do it. But at the end of the day, that's what she was going to do. Now, in Texas, uh, it, it is illegal. Did you ever worry about her getting caught or anything like that? Oh, my God. I, all the time. I, I mm-hmm. always just told told them, don't drive with it. Don't don't take it with you. Don't. And um, that really didn't work. Um, but I, I, I really did worry about, 
you know, what would happen if she got pulled over, or, you know, something like that. And that would be something on her record permanently. But that never happened. No, no. Okay. And we should um, reassert that she was working, she was paying her bills, she was taking care of her life. It was not like her using this drug was getting in the way of those things. She was being a responsible adult. Yes. She she always made sure that everything she needed to do was being done, um, you know, as far as, like, you know, her bills. Okay. <clears throat> And do you have any idea where she was getting her marijuana from? I I do not. Um, I know it's somebody, from what the girls tell me, which is my oldest daughter and her, it, somebody that they knew. And so they would always just go to this one individual. And, it, and once again, I'm only asking because this is going to come up later in the conversation. Uh, do you happen to, you don't have to say the person's name. Um, but do you know the person's name? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I don't. And, all right. We will cover that later just to set that up. Okay. Um, let's talk about those days leading up to her disappearance. Anything that you look back and say, well, that was a little weird, something, you know, maybe something that now at the time didn't seem like a big deal, but now does. Um, Actually, no, like, um, nothing stuck out, nothing, nothing was out of the ordinary, um, she was basically, you know, just doing what she needed to do, uh, if she wasn't working, she was babysitting my, my grandkids, um, she, nothing was out of the ordinary, I, I, I do remember the last day I saw her, and, I don't know if that sticks out to me because it was the last day, but I just felt like that one that day just was a little, uh, not weird, but a little bit more, <clears throat> uh, what, uh, emotional, mm -hmm. not really emotional because I just remember the last, that Sunday that I saw her okay. and, uh, they were leaving cause I had to get ready for work. And they had came over to where I was staying. And uh, I just remember looking right into her eyes and she just said, okay, baby cake, I love you. And I said, I love you too, Zoe. I love you, baby girl. And we hugged. I mean, we always hug when we say bye. But this one was just a little bit different just because we looked at each other. Okay. And I don't, I, I don't, I don't think that that meant anything. I just think that it it was because that was the last day that I saw her, the last time. So you saw her that Sunday before she disappeared. Uh, did your other sister or your other, let me start that again. Did your other daughter, Savannah, who was living with Zoe, has she since then ever told you, you know, I think that it seemed like Zoe was maybe getting a couple strange phone calls. Has your other daughter Savannah ever said anything to you about those days before Zoe's disappearance being that the two of them were living together? No, um, nothing out of the ordinary, no different cause. Uh, Zoe would, uh, Zoe and Savannah were really close. I mean, really, really close. Um, yes, they were sisters, but they, that's who they leaned on, on is on each other. They didn't have, you know, a whole lot of girlfriends or, or anything like that. So it was them two all the time. And um, Zoe never mentioned any strange phone calls to, you know, to herself. That She never mentioned it to Savannah. She, um, you know, it was all pretty much all the same. Zoe was really big on social media. You know, she she was always on that. But nothing nothing that she ever brought forward to Savannah saying, Hey, this, this, this person is really creeping me out or, or anything like that. So neither, for example, this is just an example. So neither Joe nor Jacob suddenly appeared at their apartment or anything like, like that, or were cruising by anything like that. Not, no, not that, you know, what, if they showed up at the apartment, it was because the girls knew about it. Okay. Never, 
Uh, Savannah never got the idea that Zoe was being stalked by anybody, including her ex-boyfriend. No. Okay. You said that you saw her on that day, uh, that Sunday, November 17th, 2013. Mm-hmm. Tell the <laughs> listeners uh, a little bit about the day. What, what you remember, you, you said you saw her. Uh, Zoe was going somewhere that day. She was going to somebody... Uh, a friend of hers house, somebody who just had a baby. Why don't you tell the listeners about that? Oh, um, that part, um, I, I didn't realize that she was, I didn't know she was going to her house. I actually didn't oh. even know she was still in contact with this person. Oh, okay. Um, but apparently uh, she, the, the her friend, uh, April, had just had a baby. And Zoe had went to go see the baby that night. But, you know, for, for, for my understanding, the girls, my, my daughters were going to hang out together all day. Uh, they were both off. They weren't uh, really going to do anything big. They were just going to grab dinner, uh, hang out. They had went to the store earlier that day and bought like water guns for the kids because it, that day just happened to be, you know, really warm hmm. so uh they were doing that and they were going to go home and finish getting ready and then they were uh they were going to go out to dinner and they got some movies and then went back to the apartment okay but zoe had went to go see her friend april uh before they had went to dinner all right so some maybe what i'm understanding it- now in, all right, so you didn't know that at the time. You really didn't know what Savannah and Zoe were doing that day. You just knew that they were together. Right. All right. Did Savannah go with Zoe over to this uh, girl's house, April's house, or not? No, no, Savannah she, didn't go. She had stayed at the apartment with the with the kids. Okay. So was this some type of a baby shower, or was this just a general... Uh, Zoe knew April was home, so she decided to stop in. Was this a, a gathering, a party, or is it something a little more um, unplanned? Um, from my understanding, it was just something that was unplanned. Um, apparently, April had just got out of the hospital. I don't know if it was that day or a couple of days before, mm-hmm. um, but her baby was, you know, it was a brand new newborn. So Zoe had went to go and see him and see the baby and see April as well. Okay. How did Zoe and April know each other? Um, back, uh, they had went to school. They had went to school together. They went to, I, I believe they met uh, her her uh, freshman year. Mm-hmm. Okay. Freshman to sophomore year at, at the high school. And did you even and did you know that Zoe and April were still in contact with each other? And and is your opinions of April um, pretty good? Um, I I have nothing bad to say about her. Um, I didn't know that they were still in contact with each other. Uh, like I said, the last time uh, I I had seen April was probably you know when they were like. 15 or 16 um i remember april would come over and spend the night with zoe they would have a a sleepover and that was it but once i just i just assumed they weren't speaking anymore okay just kind of grew apart or something Mm -hmm. okay so she goes there she comes home she and savannah uh get together with savannah's uh children who I, i'm going to understand i'm going to guess or being that savannah would have been in her mid-20s her kids were very young maybe five years old or younger something like that yeah they uh um, four and three i believe at the time okay so they get together uh they go out to dinner uh, but there is uh, another girl who was with them uh a jessica is that right Yes, uh, Jessica had uh, met them at the apartment, and uh, they were just hanging out, um, getting ready and stuff. I guess uh, Jessica was going to stay over that night, 
because Jessica had to work early the next morning. So, and her job was just down the street from the apartment. So she, she was going to stay the night. <clears throat> okay. So they're all there. And what does, uh, of course, you're finding out about this afterwards. What do Savannah and Jessica say about that night um, when they get back to Savannah's apartment? After dinner, they, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I was told that they stopped and got a movie. They went back to the apartment. Um, they put the movie on. For, you know, all, all of them were downstairs watching the movie with the kids. And uh, they were just hanging out uh, around 11.30. Uh, Savannah says goodnight. She takes the kids up puts them down. She said uh, Jessica was already almost asleep and Zoe was dozing on and off from the movie, so she just assumed everybody was going to go to sleep. And uh, she went upstairs and fell asleep with the kids, and that was the last time she saw her. All right, and Jessica says that she fell asleep too, and when she fell asleep, uh, Zoe was still in the apartment. Correct. Okay. Yes. They were both still in in the apartment. All right. Now, later that night, though, Zoe texted you, didn't she? Yes. All right. Tell the listeners, because that's going to be the next time that uh, anybody in your family has any interaction with Zoe. It's not until after 2 a.m. Um, that she texts you. Um, you were at work that night. Why don't you explain uh, how what all happened there? Um, yeah, uh, I had. I was at the time of her disappearance. I was working at a bar, and um, I had clo- I had shut down the bar, and a lot of my car was in the shop. So uh, behind the bar, there's a house that sometimes I would stay in if I didn't have a ride to get to my place or, you know, so I got a text. Uh, I want to say it was probably about two twenty, two fifteen, two twenty, And it was from Zoe asking if I needed a ride. And I, I said, sure. Yeah. And uh, she said, okay. And so I waited about 10 minutes. Uh, she still hadn't showed up, so I called her and um, didn't didn't get any response back. Was this unusual for her to text you, would you say, uh, at, at a late hour like that and ask if you needed a ride home? Is fairly unusual, or had she picked you up from work before? No, she hadn't picked me up. Um, at the time, I guess I didn't really even think twice about it. Uh, or wondered what is she doing up or I just assumed she was up at the at the apartment and you know she just wanted to come see if I needed a ride um so I I I guess now that I think back I I, you know it, it should have been unusual unusual to me but you know I just didn't even think about it like that at the time let me just put it this way. Were you surprised to get a text from her at 2.20 a.m. asking if you needed a ride home? That surprised you? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I was surprised, I, but I, it was a happy surprise. Like, Of course. Any time that I could have spent time with them, you know, I, 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 I did. Of course. Uh, this house that you were going to stay at, you said it was near where you worked. Is this like a friend's house or what is it? Yeah, it's actually uh, – it's right behind the bar that I work and um, my friend lived back there, but every once in a while, you know, if I needed to, I could, you know, I would stay there. Okay. Uh, did this first, was this the owner of the bar or is this not, was this no, something? he was more like a, he was more like, like a groundskeeper. Um, you know, he took care of, he watched the bar at night after it closed and then he would wake up early in the morning and clean the parking lot and all that. Um, he was he was a really good, really really good friend, and that was it. I mean, he he was an older gentleman, and uh, he just 
he was uh he was really nice to to me and to my kids and um he was just he was just a a decent de- decent man okay is this uh person different than the other guy we're going to talk about later ben oh yes definitely uh, this definitely guy, two different people yes he's he's more i i would always call him my dad oh, he's okay. like my dad you're i would that's what i would call him okay so we're going to talk about a friend of yours his name came up in the disappeared episode um, we're going to talk about him mm-hmm. a little later um so when she didn't come to when she never showed up what'd you think i i, th- I thought maybe she just fell asleep and um you know she wasn't going to come um like i said i waited about 10 minutes and i called her back and her phone rang and rang and rang and rang and then went to voicemail and so uh, i called her right back and it just started going straight to voicemail so i just assumed she fell asleep and i told uh i told my friend i was like well i guess she fell asleep she's not going to come for me and so i went into the other room and i you know I, I went to sleep. Okay. Later that morning, of course, now it would be the same day. But when did you? So that was uh, the last communication uh, that you had with Zoe. When did you realize that next morning or next afternoon that something wasn't right? Um, it was that later on that morning, probably about seven forty-five. Uh, Savannah called me and wanted to know if Zoe was with me. And uh, I had told her no. She said that because Zoe was going to take care of the kids. And um, she wasn't there at the apartment. Hmm. Did you tell Savannah about how you got a text from Zoe the night before or earlier that morning? Yeah, I, I yes. I, I told her, I was like, uh, she texted me to come uh, give me a ride. I was like, but I told her, I was like, she never showed up. Uh, I told her, I was like, I just assumed she was there at the apartment. She's like, well, she was here when I went to bed. So. Mm-hmm. And Jessica was still there. Did she, uh, was she able to offer any, of course, we know that what the story was, but is that what Jessica said, that she fell asleep on the couch and Zoe was still there? Yes, she said uh, her her uh, her statement was that Zoe and her were downstairs. Uh, Jessica had fell asleep, and she looked at Zoe, and Zoe was, you know, dozing off and on. And so Jessica just fell asleep. She said she didn't even know Zoe had left or or anything. Okay, and once again, when you got that text from her. From Zoe saying that you know, asking if she was uh, needed to pick you up. You took for granted that she was still at home when she did that. Of course, we're going to find out that that wasn't the case. But uh, that was your impression, though, that earlier that morning. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I. Yeah, I just. I. I I'm. Usually, um, from my understanding, you know, she wasn't out in the streets that late so Mm -hmm. i just assumed that she was at home right uh did you did savannah end up calling other people did you end up calling people what did you do when we figured out that when you figured out that zoe wasn't at the apartment at savannah's apartment her car is gone uh of course you try you of course would know that you tried to call her after she texted you she didn't get back to you what did you do next that day? That would have been Monday. Uh, that Monday, we we called, well, Savannah called uh, Jacob to see if he had seen her. Uh, she called Joe, and uh, she, talked, she called Jessica to see if she knew when Zoe had left. Mm-hmm. Um, she started calling her cousins. Their, their cousins and seeing if anybody had heard from her and um, no one had um, Savannah came and picked me up and I went to the apartment with her back to the apartment uh, we started calling um, hospitals 
we started calling the j- jails. Um, and no- nobody had, you know, she wasn't in nowhere. Uh, nobody had seen her. And nobody had talked to her. Right. So, um, you, so you knew her car wasn't at Savannah's, so it's possible that she could have left at right after Jessica fell asleep, maybe at around 1230 that morning. Or she could have left right before Savannah and her kids and, and Jessica woke up. I mean, it's all a huge time frame in there when she could have left. Um, according to what I now know, mm-hmm. <clears throat> she I'm just saying what you knew. I mean, we know right it eventually, but we, yeah. but at that point you're thinking, man, she could have left at 1230. She could have left at 630 in the morning. We just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Like right. I, I didn't know like what time, I mean, I was like wondering where, where is she? What, what, what is she, what is she doing? Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, we didn't know. <clears throat> okay, so you're letting your family members know, you're calling people, and I'm guessing at some point you figured out that you were the last person that you could find that communicated with your daughter, and that would have been that text at 2.20 a.m. Correct, yes, and um, I, I was just like, I, I didn't know what had happened. Um, I, 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 I was a mess. I was lost. Mm-hmm. Of course you were. Of course. When did the police get involved? Um, that Monday we called uh, the Lubbock Police Department and, you know, we gave them the situation. We told them what was going on. Uh, a policeman showed up at the apartment and didn't take a rep- uh, they didn't make a report or anything. They just said they were going to put an APB on her vehicle. Um, and that's what they were going to do. They were going to, he, he said, we're going to look, we'll look for the vehicle, but didn't take any information about her or anything. Um, okay. And that's how, that's how that Monday, that, that, that night went. Um, I ended up, I stayed there with my daughter and, uh, we just, we were still calling, uh, we, I think we called the hospital like numerous times and the jail and her friends, have you seen her now? And nobody had seen her. And your family was out riding around looking for her car, looking for her as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, once we did uh, the following day, when we still hadn't heard anything, uh, went ahead and called the police again, and they took the report. And um, that's that's when more of my family started getting involved and looking for her vehicle, uh, driving down county roads and. Mm-hmm trying to go from the apartment to where I was working, you know, different streets, different ways to see if maybe, you know, they would see her car or something and nothing was, you know, we never, we never saw her vehicle up until a few days, a couple of days later. And we should point out that the car that Zoe had, it, it's not like it's a white, you know, Toyota Camry you know, or a Honda Accord, which it seemed like they're a dime a dozen. She had a Lincoln Town car, but it had some damage Mm -hmm. on the driver's side. So it should have really stuck out. Yeah, it was, uh, the whole front fender was uh, uh, messed up. Uh, I guess the vehicle was in a wreck before. Mm -hmm. And um, it's big old long silver car. And the front fender was, you know, it was, damage so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be hard to spot this vehicle and like you said the police the lubbock police had an all points bulletin out looking for this car and they in those first few days never saw it anywhere no never saw it anywhere no the police never saw it um uh didn't I didn't actually hear from the police until we called them 
right. a, a couple of days later. Okay. Uh, in those first couple of days, uh, was there any talk about possibly pinging Zoe's phone or doing anything with a phone company, try to get triangulation on where uh, the phone could be or even possibly where she was when she texted you the last time? Any talk of that in those first couple of days? Not in the first couple of days. Um, I, uh, it wasn't until I met, I guess they assigned a detective to the case mm -hmm. and met with him. And apparently he had already been working on the case. And he said, you know, they were uh, pinging her phone and, and you know, looking at her, all her social media uh her Facebook and uh seeing what you know they could see. Uh okay. All right. Um at this point, I know you I mean you're you're worried sick and of course that feeling continues to continues to this day. But did you have any ideas, guesses, rumors in those first couple of days as what could have happened to her your 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 best uh guess as what could have happened did you um, did you suspect somebody as if something bad happened or did you did it lean more toward you well, maybe she ran away or decided to take off what were you leaning toward i i never never once never never once thought that she ran away because you know she she wouldn't she wouldn't have done that she wouldn't have hurt us like that um i just at the very beginning at first i i didn't know what happened to her i honestly was just completely just clueless i didn't know mm -hmm. uh, once i met with the detective that was assigned to the case uh he pretty much informed me of or schooled me about human trafficking uh I, I had heard about it before but only in movies and i just thought it was something that happened you know in different places i never knew that it was happening here in in lubbock so pretty much that was what i was being told because of the fact that she was you know she was pretty she was young she was petite that 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 might be what had happened. Um, so basically at the very beginning of all of this, I'm, I'm, it's in my head that she's, she's being sold. So okay. that was the only thing that I had. That was the only thing that I was thinking. Okay. And uh, given her her age, and uh, she's an attractive uh, young woman, et cetera. That is a possibility, of course, absolutely. Um, so you have these days, Monday goes into Tuesday, goes into Wednesday. Um, I'm guessing no leads. Uh, I don't think that they had done the, any of the phone work yet. But miraculously, maybe, you, you might say, her car is spotted. Why don't you tell the listeners about how that happened? Uh, yeah, um, I was I was at work, and my sister was um, driving home after because they had been driving the streets looking uh, for her, trying to see if they could spot her car. Um, she was just actually just on her way home and sees the vehicle. She spots Zoe's car. I remember I got a text saying, is Zoe's car, or a phone call saying, is Zoe's car, is there damage to the front? And I said, yes. She said, okay, well, I'm, I see it. I'm following it. She had turned back around and started following the vehicle. Uh, she had, she had called uh, her son who was also out there driving around and was telling him where she was, you know, pretty much a proximity of how, where they were going. And, uh, I called 911. Um, 
she called 911 and we were, she was just basically following this vehicle, following it. And um, apparently <clears throat> she was trying to stay back away so they wouldn't, uh, whoever was driving wouldn't um, notice her following him. Mm -hmm. uh, she did at one point pull alongside him, the vehicle and looked to see if it was Zoe. And uh, she said, uh, the person had broad shoulders, uh, a hoodie, a jacket with a hood, a hood over his head, and that she she could tell it was it was a it was a male. Um, she continued following it. I guess the person that was driving the vehicle noticed and started trying to lose my sister uh, for a period of time, not a period, uh, for a few seconds, basically, uh, she lost him, uh, but found him again. But by that time, the individual had parked Zoe's car in an apartment complex and no one was found. She, she, she did state at one time that she, I mean, that she did state that, um, she saw the individual running. Um, all she could see was like high tops, shorts and the hoodie. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, she never, she went, you know, she, her and her, the son showed up there as well, my nephew, and um, tried to look for the individual, and it would, it, they weren't nowhere to be found. Let's just be clear about this, because this is something that I noticed in the Disappeared episode that I watched a couple times before doing this interview. In the Disappeared episode regarding Zoe's disappearance, it's not stated that uh, Zoe's aunt saw this guy run away uh, from the vehicle. In fact, she says that the car turned, she kept going straight, and then she circled back around, and by t the time she got to the car, the car was empty. You're saying yes. that that is not necessarily correct, that she might have done that, but by the time she got to the car, she did see somebody get out of the car and run away. Yes. Well, she didn't see them get out of the car. She just mm -hmm. saw an individual running. Um, this is um, this is a, a, something that she has been saying um, on the the sh the show disappeared. Um, mm -hmm. I myself received two two copies. They they gave me two copies of the episode, but there's also uh, it's the episode that they aired. Plus, there's additional um, interviews uh, okay. with individuals, and and that's that's the copy that I have, and that's what I I heard. Okay, so what you're saying is that is what uh, this aunt of Zoe said, but it got she did say uh, something about somebody running away from the car, but it didn't make the final cut that made it on TV. Correct. Okay. All right. I just wanted to clear that up because I'm sure many people have seen that episode and they're going to say, well, it's not mentioned in the episode. Actually, uh, Zoe's aunt did say this. It just cut out, out of the episode. And the listeners should know, being that I used to do some film and TV production way back in the day, that happens quite mm -hmm. often. Very, yes. very and quite it, often. It also doesn't show, doesn't tell that she, she did call 911 as well. Okay. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of, comments about why didn't the aunt call 911 um she did call 911 um like i said we all called 911 several several times okay this area where she encountered this car uh a, a part of town that you know well uh part of town that uh, zoe did she know anybody in this area uh, where this car was first seen, and how long would you say that Zoe's aunt followed this car before it got parked? Was it a mile? Was it five miles? Uh, do you know? Um, as far as I know, in that area, 
that the vehicle was spotted. It's it's a main street here in Lubbock. It's called University uh, Univer- uh, uh, University. Okay. And my sister lives off of that uh, main street, so that's why she saw it because she was going home. Mm-hmm. Um. Other than that, I don't. Zoe didn't know anybody that lived um in that area the the that part of where that she first spotted the vehicle uh i believe she followed it i want to say maybe it wasn't far from that area to where the car was parked um it's probably about five miles four miles okay so she wasn't behind this car very long yeah, you know, and no, uh, not at all. I'm gonna get. I, I think your impression is that at some point the person driving that car got kind of figured out that somebody was following them, so he figured, well, I got to ditch this car. Yes. Okay. I, that's what I think is was is what happened. Um, okay. And how far is this apartment complex from where Savannah uh, and Zoe were living? Actually, that from where Savannah and Zoe live to that apartment complex, it's probably about, it's a two-minute drive, three-minute drive. So very close. Yes. So the car was spotted on this University Boulevard. I guess it wasn't too far away from Zoe and, and Savannah's apartment. And then where it ended up, two or three-minute drive is not very far either. No, no, not at all. That's okay. why we were just like, wow. Okay. So you, I think, eventually show up at this car. Now, the the agonizing thing about this, it, the cops did not respond to this these 911 calls, did they? No, no. They said um, what I was told personally was uh, there's other emergencies that were first that became priority. This one wasn't a priority. Um, uh, from the time that the car was parked to the actual time that an officer showed up was two and a half hours. Wow. Wow. So they're calling 911 to say, we're following the car of this missing girl and the police aren't doing anything. No. And while we're sitting in the parking lot waiting, we're still calling 911. We're still saying, where is the cop? You know, because in my mind, I'm thinking, what if she's in the trunk? I'm not allowed to touch the vehicle. One of my family members um, works for the sheriff. And he's like, don't touch the car because, Mm -hmm. you, you know, fingerprints and, you know, evidence. And I'm just like, I need to. I need to see if she's in the trunk. I, I, I need to. And you know, you you can't even imagine my 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 frustration, my my how crazy I was going every time I would call nine one one and just say, Where are y'all? What if my daughter's in the trunk? I was I was livid. I was I was I was. I I was beside myself. I didn't know what to do. And my family's trying to calm me down and trying to talk me, you know, to, to calm down. So then we start, uh, knocking at doors in front of the apartment, you know, the apartments that were in front of the car and asking, have you ever seen this vehicle here before? And, you know, whoever would answer the door, you know, we would talk to, um, you know, it, it was starting to get late, so, you know, people weren't answering, but it was just, it was, it was, it was a crazy night, and then finally when the cops showed up, <clears throat> they don't, they don't want to talk to me first. As the mother, they don't want to talk to me because of the fact that I'm irritated, I'm, I'm frustrated, I, I am upset. I'm emotional and the cop is so rude and tells me step aside. I'm not going to talk to you. 
and I'm just freaking out. So my fam, my my sister had to pull me and say, "Calm down, come over here, calm down." He takes, he talks to my nephew who works for the sheriff. Like I said, talks to him, and we're telling him, you know, it's a missing girl. This is what's going on. We just spotted the vehicle. Can you open the trunk? And finally, after about 15, 20 minutes, they open the trunk and no, you know, there's no sign of her. Okay. Let me just ask you some questions, uh, Melinda, about the car. And I know this is very difficult. Um, was the car, being that it was left there, somebody ran away, was it locked? Were the keys in it? The keys were not in it. The vehicle was unlocked. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we, we looked like through the windows, you know, to see mm -hmm. what was in there. And, um, there was a, a, a jacket her cell phone charger. Zoe doesn't go anywhere without her cell phone charger. That was in there. Okay. And the back seat. The charger was in the back seat. Yes. Okay. That also probably, being that the car was unlocked, that also probably, you standing there waiting to open it probably also added to it, being that you knew you could get into the car if you wanted to, but it was unlocked, because it was unlocked, but you didn't, you couldn't, you didn't want to. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to, but I just yeah. couldn't. Um, um, I, 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 I didn't want to mess with, you know, if they found anything. Of course. But at the same time, you know, I wanted to get in that vehicle. Okay. And I kept walking around the vehicle, and I, before they opened it, and I just remember saying. I just remember saying, Zoe, if you're in there, I'm right here, and we're going to open it real soon. I just remember just walking around, just saying that, Zoe. Zoe, I'm right here, if you're in there. Do we need to take a moment there, Melinda? I am good. That was just a moment. It's, it's, it's passed. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, are we to believe, are we to understand that uh, Zoe's car was somewhere in Lubbock during those few days? Was her license plate on the car? Yes. Okay. And this time of night that this car was being driven. Uh, what time of night was it when uh, Zoe's aunt saw originally saw the car? Um, I believe, I believe it was at n between nine and nine thirty. Okay. Is the timeline that we 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 got? All right. So just to to frame this for the listeners, we're to understand Zoe is missing. She's been missing for two to three days. And somebody, we don't know if this guy is the person who caused Zoe to disappear, maybe found the car on some street somewhere, we just don't know. But somebody was driving Zoe's car on the main street in Lubbock with her license plate on it. Correct. That's a little, I have to admit, that's a little strange. It is. Like, I, I don't understand. I don't know mm -hmm. if they were going to ditch the car somewhere or I, I I don't it's also amazing that the police didn't see it you know Lubbock has a decent sized police department it's a Lincoln it has a damaged front fender I mean how many Lincolns with damaged left front fenders can there be in Lubbock Texas I don't think too many exactly yeah. <laughs> you know so that is that is something that is still uh, a big question in my mind, uh, you know, five years later, four and a half years later. Um, and, and, in, and in mine as well. Okay. So what we're saying is there was, 
There was nothing done to the car to disguise it in any way. It wasn't, it wasn't like somebody else's license plate on it. Nobody tried to change the rims on it. Nobody tried to paint it. Uh, nothing like that. It was just her car. No, it was exactly, it was exactly how Zoe had it. Okay. Nothing, nothing out of, nothing out of place. Okay. Nothing. What was in the car? Now there was uh, a, a a man's gray sweatshirt uh, in it. Uh, any logo on it? Any insignia on it? Anything that might lead anybody to believe who owned that sweatshirt? No, um, it was just a uh, gray zipped up uh, hoodie. Um, her, like I said, her phone charger was in the back seat. Uh, there was nothing in the front seat. Um, when they opened the trunk, Zoe's purse was in there. Um, her jacket was in there. Um, gray duct tape wires um, was basically it. But that's not as suspicious as everybody might make it out to be, uh, the, the no, duct tape no, and the wire. She, Please explain to the listeners why that's not as suspicious as it might sound. Um, the duct tape and the wires was something that she had used prior because uh, she had just got a new grill for her her car. And um, she couldn't find the the bolts to put it in. So she actually just put like a little bit of wiring in it and used a little bit of the duct tape for the wiring. Um, and that was, that's what that was for. Okay. Yeah. We started hearing about duct tape and wire in missing persons cases and people's minds go in a different direction. So I, I want to make yeah. sure that we, we keep everybody's mind on uh, what those things, what the purpose, what their purpose actually was. And it's not as, Suspicious as we might think. Um, the police uh, did process the car. It's been four and a half years later. Uh, did they get any fingerprints off of the car? Anything? And uh, was there anything in the car that showed any signs of violence or anything like that? Um, uh, according to them, when they took the vehicle, uh, they could not get any um, fingerprints. Uh, they were just partials that they said they, they got, um, the car, uh, was actually towed that night, uh, to the police department. And then it was released the next day. And it was sent back to you. Yes. All right. And and so they processed it, but once again, fingerprints haven't been able to allegedly couldn't get any fingerprints off the car. That's a little hard to believe, being that it was sitting somewhere for three days. But um, no signs of anything else in there, as far as DNA, no. anything like that in the car that you know of. That the police have told you that I know of. No. Um... I, I, I don't know exactly what they did to process the vehicle. All I know is that uh, fingerprints were not found, or just partial fingerprints. And um, then they released the vehicle. So Okay. When you got the vehicle back, between yourself, uh, your other daughter, Savannah, maybe other people in your family, when you got the car back, was there anything to you that stuck out as being unusual about the vehicle that maybe the police wouldn't have noticed since they didn't know Zoe like you did? Um, when we, we finally got the vehicle and I was actually able to just be in there. Um, there, there really wasn't, there was nothing out of place, nothing, um, nothing alarming or disturbing about the vehicle. Um, the police had already taken her her charger, the the men's jacket, her purse, her jacket, 
they had already taken all that. So her purse was in the car. Her purse was in the trunk. Oh, her purse was in the trunk. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you never got to see what's in the purse. No. Okay. No. All right. Okay. I was um, somehow I missed that when we talked before. I didn't have that in my notes. So her purse was found in the trunk. Yeah. Okay. And did the police ever tell you what they found in her purse? No. Okay. No, they they never they I till this day I I don't know. They said they ran the jacket for DNA and that um nothing came out of it. But come to find out I guess they had questioned Jacob. Mm -hmm. And he had said he had worn that prior. So you're telling me that Jacob owned up to that sweatshirt being his? Really? Yeah. That he had borrowed it from uh, Ben. And he had used it once when him and Zoe were together and he had just left it there. So originally it belonged to Ben, but now Jacob was the one that was wearing it. All right. Well, we're going to talk about Ben here in a second. So that gray sweatshirt, when you saw it in there, you didn't know whose it was, but eventually somebody who you knew, uh, know ended up owning up to owning it. Right. I, I when, when I saw it that night that we found the vehicle, Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know whose it was. I, I had no idea. Okay, but then eventually uh, you did find it out. So out let's that... let's put it. Let's make it. Um, let's put it this way: the sweatshirt that was found in the vehicle was not owned by the guy who ended up parking there and running away. No. At least to our knowledge. As far as I know, no, because. Um, they, uh, it was already when I guess whenever they talked to or questioned Jacob, it was, it was told that he was, he told that it was, he was the one wearing it at one point in time. And, um, okay. he said who he, he told who it belonged to. Okay. Were you aware that Zoe was riding around with a sweatshirt from your friend Ben? Once we're gonna get, we're gonna we're gonna talk to him about him in a moment. Were you aware that she was riding around with one of Ben's sweatshirts in her car? No. When no. was the last time I, that you were in the car with with Zoe? Uh, probably about. I want to say uh, two weeks prior to her going missing. Okay. I remember and she had she had picked me up and took me some. She took me to the store. Okay. At that time, do you remember seeing any sweatshirts or other pre people's clothes in the back seat of her vehicle? No. All right. And when you talked to no, Savannah, but... once you found out about this sweatshirt and who it belonged to. Did Savannah remember, being that they all went out, I'm guessing that they went in Zoe's car, does she remember ever seeing a sweatshirt or a shirt or anybody else's clothes in Zoe's car? No, no. The When they went out, uh, it was in uh, Savannah's car. Oh, they didn't take Zoe's car. They took Savannah's car. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, when do you think the last time was that Savannah was in Zoe's car. Can you even take a guess? Uh, probably when she bought it. All right, so it's it was a um, while. It was a while. Yeah, yeah, because Savannah, you know, had her own vehicle. Okay, and since November two thousand thirteen, has anybody told you that I was in Zoe's car and saw other people's clothes in it? Anybody no. ever? No. No, other than the police. I mean, right. letting me know that. All I'm trying to establish is I'm trying to figure out 
if Zoe was really riding around with some other guy's sweatshirt in the back of her car. That seems a little unusual to me. But I don't I don't know your daughter. Yeah. I didn't I don't know her. You of course do. Does that sound unusual to you? Um it 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 really doesn't because I know when she bought the vehicle, um she was still talking to Jacob. Mm-hmm. And her and Jacob and Ben were we're we're still talking a little bit. Mm-hmm. We have to remind the listeners: Jacob is the boyfriend, and Ben is a friend of yours. And Correct. Ben and Jacob knew each other. Yes. Okay. Were they close? Were they friends? How did they know each other? Um. <laughs> they actually they met through Zoe. Oh, they met through Zoe. Okay, we're just going to leave it at that because we're going to talk about Ben here in a little bit. Uh, Let's move on to this. When did you discover that Zoe actually went out after everyone went to bed that night? Remember, Savannah goes to bed with her children. Jessica falls asleep on the couch. Zoe's still there, but you found out somehow that Zoe went out after that. How did that all happen? Uh, It it all happened through... Uh, one of the one of the many times that I would go to the police department and talk to my detective, and he finally came out and said that I I I believe there was a text message that got Zoe out of the house, and that was the last. There was a phone call couple of phone calls and the text messages that she sent me. After the uh, Savannah went to bed, after Jessica fell asleep, Zoe had some interaction with someone beside you. We know about the text, but somebody else after the, those women went to bed. Yes. Um, what I'm finding out is uh, she had met an individual when she had went to go see April's baby okay. uh april introduced her to uh a friend of hers and that person they exchanged numbers zoe and this individual and um from what i'm being told is they had communication after 11 30 and from what we're understanding or, or, or trying to piece together is he's the one that took her out of, not took her, but, you know, made her come out of the apartment. Okay. This is a guy who was, uh, they did not say his name on the disappeared episode, but we're going to use his first name uh, just mm-hmm. to make the, the telling of all of this a little easier. I, I uh, you should know that, Melinda knows his last name. I know his last name, but we're going to keep it under wraps for now. But his first name is Carlos. Um, Once again, they did not use his name in the disappeared episode. Um, Did he also not uh, send her a message on Facebook about coming over or something like that? Yes, there was a, a message on Facebook and there were phone calls on her cell phone. And I... I believe there was a text message. Okay. And then prior to to the one I received, and then after, um, I believe after two thirty to I believe it was still till six o'clock in the morning. He uh, was still texting her cell phone. Okay. So through all this, through the the phone, we'll get into the pings here in a moment, but. Uh, Carlos was the guy that she met uh, at April's uh, baby party, this get-together. I'm taking that Zoe and Carlos never met before? Correct. All right. And when did the police find out about Carlos, and and how? when did they go talk to him, and what did he have to say? Um, At the beginning, from my understanding, it wasn't until they got Zoe's phone records 
because uh, they, of course, have to get the warrant and everything. Um, and they saw the the calls, and also they got a warrant for her Facebook account. Um, and they saw her her messages. Um, at the beginning, Carlos was saying that he wasn't with her. Um, he met her at April's. He did he did own up to that, but mm-hmm. he was saying. No, I I didn't see her. No, I didn't hang out with her. And then I guess after a couple of interviews is when he finally came back and said that he did see her that night. They hung out. They smoked. And uh, I guess he wanted to smoke again or both of them wanted to smoke again. Um, but Zoe had said she had to go get some more weed and his story is that she left and never came back okay so she's at home with savannah and jessica carlos who had just met her earlier that day starts contacting her maybe he was contact her all evening we're not sure but uh, she decides that she's going to go see this carlos fella she jumps in her car she goes over to his house. Uh, was he living by himself, or did he have roommates, or what was his living situation at the time? Um, I believe he was living with his parent, his brother, and I believe that's it. I don't know if his the mother of his children was living there at the time. Okay, so Carlos had uh, at least one child already? Um, yes, at least one. Okay, and, and how old is Carlos? At the, well, at the time? Uh, he's Zoe. He he was Zoe's age. Uh, he was probably about eighteen, nineteen when okay. they first met. All right, so it's not like Carlos is living in his own place where Zoe would go over there, and it would just be the two of them. You're telling me that he was living at home, and there were at least a couple other people under the same roof with him. So if Zoe showed up at his place. Uh, it might have been late, and those people might have been in bed, but um, it wasn't like Zoe and Carlos were alone. No. Uh, according to Carlos's story, uh, they stayed uh, outside in, on, in her car. Oh, so maybe Zoe never went inside. Okay. So she gets over there. Carlos is there. Uh, they're smoking uh, weed, and then Carlos is saying that Um, They ran out of marijuana, and Zoe, I guess, volunteered or said that that she could get some more. She left. She never came back. That is Carlos' story. Uh, And there is at least proof that he tried to message her at like 4 a.m., 6 a.m., trying to find out where she was. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Okay. But we also have to remember that... Um, he originally lied to the police saying that he never saw her that night. Yes. All right. And then he finally broke down. Um, do you know, um, if Carlos has ever been given a lie detector test regarding that night? Uh, no, he, um, as far as to my knowledge, he has not, um, only because, um, once he started getting questioned about Zoe, uh, he quickly lawyered up and so according to my detective it was very hard to talk to him right okay so so he lied and then he told the truth but we just don't know how much truth he really told uh he at least admitted to meeting zoe um but then he says she left and we just don't know aren't sure if that's true or not um Carlos's and well, can... Zoe's phones were eventually pinged. Um, the information. What did the information uh, tell the police, and what did you find out about it? Uh, that it, their her her cell phone was pinged. It, it was one mile radius of a certain area, um, and that in, that would include Carlos's home. And so, did you eventually find out that the text that she sent you? That text at 2.20 a.m., 
uh, where she was asking if you needed picked up um, was done in that radius. It was not, that text was not sent from Savannah's apartment. It was actually sent somewhere in the vicinity of where Carlos lives. Correct. It was in that one mile radius, yes. Okay. And what about Carlos? Do you, have you ever found anything about Carlos's phone? Is there any proof that he was out of the area away from his house at that time? Have the police ever told you anything about any of that? No, they have not told me anything about his cell phone or, or anything about his social media or anything like that. No. And there was this place called I, that I saw in the Disappeared episode, Lowry Field. Uh, does that have a mm -hmm. significance uh, to this case? Is that a location? Uh, what do the listeners need to know about that? Um, Lowry Field is, is a big uh, football field where all the high schools go and play football. But I, the reason why that was brought up, Lowry Field, is because that field is just right across the street from where Carlos lived. And the tower that they're using for the cell phone ping is in that area. So um, they said Lowry Field only because that was the, the, the main, not the main, um, the, the something that uh, uh, like a, a landmark that maybe people would notice yeah landmark. yeah like a landmark like people would people would notice and know that that was the area all right because it was mentioned in the episode I thought that might be able to give an idea if they're going to do any Google mapping or anything that'll give them uh, an idea um, we're gonna come back to Carlos in a little bit but what was established with Carlos is that Zoe did go out that night. She did see this Carlos guy. We're not sure what happened. Looks suspicious, of course. Um, but he did try to message her a couple times, claiming that she left and never came back. But we should be clear that it wasn't like he texted her. I think he Facebook messengered, messaged her instead. Am I right about that? Mm -hmm. I, I do believe so. Um, okay. I think there was maybe one on her phone, a couple of them. Or where he tried calling or, or something to that effect. But some of the messages or, or phone calls were to her phone, her actual phone. Okay. The reason I'm saying that is because I'm guessing that if he is trying to hide his location, if he did do something to, to Zoe, that messaging would be a way to contact her with while covering up where his location was. Whereas if you use texting, of course, it's going to bounce off. Uh, a tower and give you a location. I'm not sure about all the technicalities of that, but that's something that did uh, come to my mind when I was um, thinking about that. I'm sure people might know a little bit more about that than I do. We've mentioned Ben uh, a couple times. He was mentioned in the Disappeared episode as well. His name is Ben Flores. How do you know him? And we're going to get into why uh, his name is significant and the role he might have played in all this. Um, how do you know Ben? How long have you known him? Um, I met Ben um, when I worked at the bar. Uh, beginning, he was, you know, just a friend. He was the you know, sweetest guy ever. Um, we eventually tried to work something out to become a couple. Um, it didn't work. Uh, I think we tried for like two to three weeks, maybe, maybe a month, um, realized that it didn't work, but then, you know, there was a lot of times where, you know, we had a lot of cookout and, um, Ben came and he met my daughters, he met my grandkids. Um, you know, we were all just, we just like would hang out and, um, Eventually, uh, when Zoe was uh, attending school, um, because my car was in the shop and this was right before she got her, her vehicle, um, Ben would uh, go to school or sometimes he would just drop her off and pick her up. Um, I would ask him if he could do that and, you know, he said yes. And, you know, he's just, he was just, 
a friend, a friend to Zoe, uh, a friend to myself. Savannah, um, too? Yeah, to Savannah. And, you know, he treated them with, you know, nothing but, you know, respect. Um, just uh, things just didn't work for me and him. But, you know, we, we were still friends. Okay. How long would you say that you knew him before Zoe disappeared? Um, probably about a year. All right, so a year. Uh, late, let's say late 2012. Okay. Yeah. Now, in fact, you saw Ben that night, that Sunday evening. You're at work. You're working at the bar. You actually saw him. He was there. Yes, he was there. He was uh, he was there drinking. Um, I I I know. I I don't remember exactly what time he got there, but I know he he left about. I, I want to say about one one between one and one thirty one fifteen one twenty. Uh, he had pretty he was pretty pretty intoxicated. Um, okay. He left because I had said um, it was time for him to go. Okay, so you're you're friends with them and you're serving him, and at some point, as a friend, you kind of told him, Ben, I think you maybe have had enough. Yeah, it, it because that, I knew he still had to drive home. All right, he had and to be so maybe from the bar, which okay. So you might have dr yeah, been drinking and driving that night, just to be honest. Oh yeah, yeah. He oh yeah. He that was okay. him. His home from the bar was probably about three minutes. It was just across a uh, uh, one, you know, down the street and across one major street. Okay. Now, the reason we're talking about him, and this is the same Ben whose uh, sweatshirt was in the back of Zoe's car. Correct. All right. And we just to remind the listeners, the story goes that once they talked to Jacob, Jacob claims that he had been wearing that sweatshirt, but he had gotten it from Ben. Yes. Um, Jacob and Ben, uh, they knew each other. They uh, because of Zoe, um, it's not like, you know, they wouldn't like hang out, hang out, but right. you know, times that Zoe would use Ben's car or Zoe or Ben would pick up Zoe, you know, a lot of the times like Jacob was there. And so that's how they got to know each other. And I guess, uh, Ben was comfortable enough with Jacob to lend him or give him a sweatshirt. I, I, I don't know. Okay. But somehow, one way or another, that sweatshirt was still in the car uh, the night that Zoe disappeared or got put in afterwards, which is a totally other scenario. But the reason we're talking about him is that once the police got Zoe's phone records, there was actually a call between Zoe and Ben that night and specifically not long after he left the bar where he saw you yes is that right um a court uh yes uh i found out from the detective that apparently there was a 20 to 30 minute phone call between uh zoe and ben um who called who ben, did he call her did she call him do you know I, I don't know who I I don't know who called who. Okay. Um. Uh, I just know there was a phone call. I'm assuming that Zoe called him, but I'm I'm you know Could, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I don't know. Okay. okay. Um, according to to Ben, he doesn't remember any of the conversation. He doesn't even. Uh, he says that he doesn't remember Zoe calling him. Is it pop is it possible that Ben might have drunk called her? It, it, it's possible. Okay. Um according to, you know, what I'm piecing together bit by bit, you know, or or or, or trying to make sense of everything. I I I think Zoe called him. Okay. 
But he says he doesn't remember the phone call. Um, is he saying that because, and once again, you saw him that night. You would have seen him 15 minutes before this phone call was made. Uh, is it your impression that he might have been so drunk that he wouldn't remember a half-hour phone call? Yes. Ben was a type that once, once uh, he reached his limit, it uh, as soon as like he would walk outside or, or the air would hit him, it would hit it would hit him harder. Like he would it get just, even more drunker. Right, okay. and not to mention that you know, you know he was doing other things um, other than drinking. So he had some other addictions. So, yes. So. Okay. I just, I, I just assumed everything just kind of, everything hits him and then he just, he's over the top drunk. Okay. Being that you knew him for a year before Zoe disappeared, had you ever had any conversations with him on the phone uh, where he was drunk? No. No? All right. And, no, and in I the didn't, no. year of knowing him... Uh, do you have, know of any other occasions where he had talked to you or one of your daughters, once again, since he got to know them so well, in which he didn't remember the phone call later? No. 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 Okay. Because I know Zoe would tell me, Mom, I'm going to ask Ben if, I, if he can take me to school. Mom, can you ask Ben? Mom, or, you know, to that effect. Okay. And we have to remind the listeners, Ben is in his 50s. Yes. All right. And Zoe yes, was 18 uh, when she disappeared? Mm hmm. He's in his fifth. Uh, he's a veteran. Uh, he had bad knees. He was skinnier than Zoe. Uh, short. Um, so there's phone call was made. Somebody, I mean, exists. We don't know who called who. Uh, the, the phone call is somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes long. I mean, that's a. I mean, these days, being the people text and everything, a 20 to 30 minute call is a long call these days in the it's, 21st yes, century. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, he claims he doesn't remember this, but uh, you personally, you knowing the da your daughter the way you do, is there any reason you can think of that she would call Ben? I think uh, knowing now what I know, Mm -hmm. Um, I think that she probably, because of the fact that, um, in the bar, my, my, my cell phone wouldn't always ring. Um, even though someone would call me, it wouldn't ring. Um, I think maybe she called him to ask him if he was at the bar and if I was there. Um, I think that's what started the conversation. I think that, or that's what initiated the phone call. Okay. Um, I think that she was trying to get a hold of me. Um, I, I think that, um, she was in a situation where maybe she wasn't comfortable and that even though he doesn't remember the conversation, I think she did it to probably, um, how do I say it? Um, she probably did it to um, let whoever she was, let the person that she was with at the time know that someone knows where she's at. Okay. Do you think that... She uh, my impression, once again, just trying to to look at this timeline, are you under the impression that she was in the company of Carlos while she was on the phone talking to Ben? Yes. All right, so Carlos was there and waiting while she was on the phone with Ben for a half hour. That's, that is what I believe, um, according to what, you know, what they, what I've been told, um, not just by detectives, but also uh, my daughter, Savannah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that she maybe felt uncomfortable 
and was looking for a reason to leave or letting trying to let someone know where she was okay um like i said um and and i know earlier i had said that they had smoked and they had wanted to smoke again and that zoe was going to go get some more weed she mm-hmm. she said she was going to go get it but according to my daughter savannah they had just bought some so zoe had some so there would be no reason why zoe would need to go buy anymore all right so all right we're gonna I'm we're gonna thinking. i think get back to that in a, in a little bit as well but um you're just to maybe condense this Maybe Zoe feels like she is in a bad situation. She's trying to figure out how to get out of it. She figures, well, being that I can't reach my mother, I can call Ben and maybe I can talk my way out of this situation by talking to Ben and then I can get Carlos out of here. Something like that. Some, uh, that's what I'm, I'm assuming. Okay. Uh, but we do have to put this on the record. Ben was asked about that night and he took a polygraph test. Did he pass it? Yes, he did take a polygraph test. Um, he failed one question, and that was um, that question was, "Do you do you know do you know what happened to Zoe?" What do you think about that, Melinda? Um, it it, it infuriates me. It it does put doubt in in my mind in my in my head um i i need to keep all all options open but at the same time i know this man and i know maybe maybe that's it's clouding my judgment mm-hmm. i mean you know because it, it is my daughter you know this is my baby girl sure but at the same time i i i know zoe's zoe's strength and i and i know ben's strength and I just feel like if he did anything to her or tried to do anything to her, Zoe would have overpowered him. That's how strong she really, really was. Mm-hmm. And, and, and and Ben being in the state that he was, I don't think that he could have done anything. As to the reason why he failed it, I, I, I don't know. I know that I know that Ben is an alcoholic, Ben is a smoker. He was he was in the in in an interview for over eight hours with no cigarette, no beer. I don't know if that has anything to affect the the results. I I don't know, and I don't know why he just failed this one question. I I did talk to him. I as soon as I found out he failed that one question, I did confront him and ask him, and he swears. He doesn't know why he failed it. He doesn't understand all this. He's telling me now. Am I completely ru- ruling him out? No, no, never. Okay. But at the same time, like I, 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 I you know, I, I don't think that that's what happened. Okay. Okay. How long after? Zoe disappeared. Did you find out that Ben and Zoe had had this conversation? Was it a week later? Was it a month later? Anything? Uh, that uh, just a guess. It was probably months, 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 months okay. later. Because I, I, like I said, that um, I wasn't told a lot about her case at the beginning. Okay. And in that time, being that I know that it sounded like you and Ben had tried to have a relationship, didn't work out. Seems like maybe he has an alcohol problem, maybe some other things that might have gotten in the way of your relationship, none of my business. In that time, did you ever talk to his, to him about Zoe's disappearance? Oh, yes. Um, okay. And not once several, did he ever say that he talked to Zoe that night? No. Um, he just said he doesn't remember. He was, like I said, he said he went straight home. And um, he doesn't remember the doesn't recall the phone call at all. Okay. Does uh, I have to ask, once again because I'm in the position that I am, I have to ask these questions. Are you telling me that in those mm-hmm. months that he never looked at his phone bill and never saw that he had a conversation with Zoe that night? I don't even know. I I don't I don't know if he would even look to see it. 
Okay. Uh, I know that w- once they, you know, when they did um, bring him in for questioning, I know that they 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 asked for permission to look through his phone records. Okay. All right. Um, did he ever go out? I mean, did you do any searches? Did he ever come out? I mean, once again, I don't know how close you two ended up being, um, but did he go out and do any searches with you? I know you had some gatherings that were shown on the disappeared episode. Did he ever show up for any of those? Anything like that? No, no. Okay. Um, it wasn't too long after she went, she disappeared that, um, um, I, I pretty much stopped talking to a lot of people that, um, were, uh, were at the bar. Mm. Uh, Ben was, Definitely one of them. As okay. soon as, you know, I found out he failed his test, um, we, we didn't have a lot of communication, hardly Okay. Nothing. Uh if I, if I can ask, when was the last time you actually talked to Ben? I don't even remember. It's um, been a, it, let's just put it this way. Has it been a while? It's been a, it's been a long time, yes. Okay. It's probably within the first year that she went missing. Okay. We're just going to leave it at that. The listeners will make up their own minds. Um, who is, and this is a woman, woman's name that came up in the Disappeared episode as well, Kim Cruz. Who is she? Um, from what I'm finding out about Kim Cruz is she worked at this motel that's called the Villa here in Lubbock. Um, well, actually, she didn't work her her boyfriend was the maintenance guy there. Um, she was stating that she had seen Zoe there at the villa um, that that night that she disappeared. Um, the villa is, uh, is it's known for uh, drugs, prostitution, um, it's it's just not a very decent motel. You, and um, let's and to put it this way, you knew about this villa motel well before Zoe ever disappeared. It has like a reputation. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I had I had heard about you know little parts, little bits here and there about the villa. Like you know, don't stay there. It's dirty and you know stuff like that. And that did I know that you know people were doing what they were doing in there. No, um, that wasn't the kind of stuff that I guess I was so naive about it that I, you know, it just, it just never hit me. I just would always, I was just knew don't stay at that hotel because of the dirty people that stay there. That's, that's what I knew about it. Okay. Um, come, you know, later on to find out, you know, it was known for a lot of other things. And, um, Kim had said she had seen Zoe at the villa the night that she had disappeared. Hmm. But from my understanding, uh, she had met Zoe prior to that. And only because, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, Zoe was a big animal lover Hmm. and uh, Jacob for about a couple of days or I, I believe a week, he had stayed at the villa with one of his cousins when him and Zoe were still talking. So Zoe was at the villa, like would go and see him at the villa. Um, that's when I believe she met Kim because well, when I had talked to Kim at the, at the beginning, Kim had said that she had met her because Zoe had asked about her dog. Uh, she had a pit bull and Zoe was real big about pit bulls. She loved pit bulls. And she, she asked about the dog. Kim was walking the dog and Zoe had seen it and, you know, went to go pet it. And, and that's what I was told Kim had said, how she met Zoe. Okay. So what you're saying is at some point later, yeah, it, it the the story changes completely. Okay. And what did that the story change to? She had seen. 
that that's what she had seen. She had seen Zoe that night uh, at the villa. Or, uh, I believe it was between one and two. And and did she say was Zoe with somebody or was she by herself? Uh, I I think she said she was by herself. Okay. But um, from I mean I I know my private investigator talked to her. Um, but nothing could be like recorded or anything like that. Um, I I, I don't know the I, I I don't honestly believe her credibility. Uh, you don't believe that Kim Cruz saw your daughter Zoe at the Villa Motel the night that Zoe disappeared. You don't believe that? I, I don't know. And um, according to my private investigator, at the you know that I did have, um, I I, she, I don't think that she believed her either. Hmm. Because I have to tell you that the the disappeared episode, once again, I know they cut things out. I know I have my own big complaints that my listeners know regarding disappeared and how they handle things. Uh, I got the impression that it was kind of the exact opposite, that uh, that you're a private investigator, um, and maybe we should talk about that a little bit, um, did believe Kim's sighting. That was my impression. Am I wrong about that? I... When I talked to her, Paula, to Paula, my private investigator at the time, um, I was under the impression that she didn't believe her, that Hmm. um, she felt that Kim um, was a little, I don't want to be rude or ugly, but like delusional. Um, Okay that she wasn't in her right state. Okay. Apparently she was in hiding or, or something from something along in her life. Uh, I don't know everything, um, but that everything and it could wasn't... be, I mean, it could be something as simple that Kim saw Zoe there, but might've been back when, Car- when Jacob was at the villa. Maybe that's what she was. That's remembering. what I- I, that's what I'm assuming. I'm, I'm thinking about that because I do remember Zoe had said that he was staying with his cousin at the villa and that she would go and see him. After Jacob, like I said, he was only there for a couple of days, maybe up to a week, maybe. And then uh, he went back to where he was staying and Zoe hadn't gone back since. And we also have to remember that there is reward money out there for information leading to finding Zoe, and it could be that Kim could be motivated by that as well. It, it could be, yes. Yeah, that, and uh, we always have to, and that's the the problem with reward money, that it will bring people who like to tell stories uh, out of the woodwork. I guess that on the other hand, uh, we have, of course, proof that Zoe was on her phone between 1.30 and 2 o'clock in the morning, and, of course, that was with Ben. And Kim is saying she saw Zoe on the phone. So it kind of, you know, there is the realm of possibility, of course. Yes. A lot of young women are on the phone these days, so it's just hard to say. Yeah, it it really is. I mean, I'm... It's not that I'm completely ruling it out. I just, mm-hmm. I just, uh, I know, I know Zoe, and um, I know her better than anyone. And I just, I, I don't think that she would be there if she didn't have to be there in a place like that. Let me ask you this: uh, being that, and we're going to talk about Carlos again here in, in a bit, um, a little bit more deeply. Is it possible? that she saw Carlos and Carlos's story is true that she said she was going to get more weed. Is it possible that the Villa Motel would be somewhere where Zoe might go to get more marijuana? Is that possible? Um, for Zoe to go to the Villa to get weed? Yeah. No, 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 not at all. Okay. All right. I can, I can honestly say no. All right. Cause it sounds like, 
that would be the type of place where you might find something like that. But I don't oh, I'm know. sure. I'm sure. You know, I don't... I'm sure it is. But okay. like, like I said, uh, Zoe, Zoe knew who to go to already, and if she needed some, that would be the person to go to. Okay. Um, and is the Villa Motel in the vicinity of the cell phone tower that that uh, Zoe's phone was pinging off of that night. Yes. It is. Okay. Let's move back to Carlos. Now, we sh- you should, the listeners should know, you didn't even know about him, I mean, until well after Zoe disappeared. I mean, a few years, as a matter of fact. Is that right? Yes, that is, that is right. I, I had no idea about Carlos. Essentially, you're out there trying to figure out what happened. Your family's out there trying to figure out what happened. Of course, Ben's name eventually comes up with the phone records and everything, but the police withheld Carlos's name from you. Yes. Okay. Um, I, 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 um, I didn't know anything about Carlos until probably like two to three years, two, two years maybe, and that was only that they had they had um uh facebook each other now i didn't know anything about the april thing until the disappeared aired is that right and then that wow that, that's how that's how carlos and zoe met i didn't know anything as to how they met or or, or it or anything I didn't even know Zoe had went to go see April until after Disappeared aired. Not even your other daughter told you. Did Savannah know? I mean, Savannah surely had to know what Zoe did earlier that day. Not that it might be a topic of conversation, but that seems weird that Savannah wouldn't even mention that to you. I don't think that it was even brought up. I don't think that Zoe brought it up because, uh, uh, she it was never mentioned to me through through savannah okay well that's interesting okay i didn't know that um while we're on the topic have you had a chance to talk to april about carlos um i i actually talked to april um probably like a few weeks ago. Oh, is that right? Maybe. Huh. Yeah. That just because, like I'm saying, like I didn't even know Zoe had went to go see April. I didn't know any any part of that. Um, uh, so I actually I Facebooked her and asked her if she could call me, mm-hmm. and she called me, and we talked for about five minutes, maybe, and I asked her what happened the last night, the last time that she saw Zoe. And uh, she gave me her story that, you know, Zoe showed up to see her, her baby, and that it was her and Zoe and Carlos in the same room. Uh, They were never alone. They did, she said they did talk. Um, Zoe left. And Carlos, Carlos left right behind her. And she said maybe that's when they exchanged numbers or they said, hey, can I? She didn't know because she said she wasn't okay. down there. That's fine. Uh, how did April even know Carlos? If Zoe's friends with April and Zoe didn't know Carlos, how did April know Carlos? Do you have any idea? She said she she knew him from uh school from high school they were friends they were they were uh acquaintances so carlos just happened to show up to see the baby and um happened to be right when zoe was there too did april ever i mean being that you didn't find out about carlos for a couple years you didn't know that uh, Zoe was out somewhere that night. I mean, those things were not, um, you didn't find out about these things till later. Um, did, 
April know that Zoe and Carlos met that night? Uh, she says, according to her, when I when I talked to her, she says that she didn't know that they had met that night. That uh, the whole time that Zoe was there and that Carlos was there, they were never alone. Uh, April was always there. The only time is when uh, Zoe left and walked to her car and that she said, Carlos had said, okay, well, I'm leaving too. And he walked. Okay. I guess, I guess, I think I need to be more, a little more succinct about this. After Zoe's disappeared, did April ever talk to Carlos and did Carlos ever tell April, you know, Zoe was over at my house that night? That I don't know. Okay. That never came up when you talked to April? No, my big thing when I talked to April was just to find out, like, how did Zoe meet him? And right. what 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 is his connection with you? What have you found out about Carlos since you found out, you know, his full name, the police finally revealed that to you? What have you found out about him? Um... What I know about him is that he has been in trouble with the law. Um, he currently, right now, is in prison. He's in jail, not prison, jail, mm-hmm. um, for uh, stalking a female. Um, from what uh, my old detective told me, um, He's uh, very, very explicit about sex um, on the phones that they record. Um, I know that he's got two little boys, but he has, I believe he's got domestic violence on his record as well with her. Mm -hmm. Um, Basically, that's all I know about him right now. Uh, do you know if he's any on any sex offender list or not? No, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Unless with this charge that he's waiting on, the okay. stalker, I, I don't know if that carries, uh, you know, for him to do that. I, I, I don't know. Okay. Did he have any uh, problems with women, issues with women, any charges against him, any rumors about his behavior before he and Zoe met back in 2013? that I know of, no. But okay. like I said, I'm I'm just honestly really just finding out about him. Okay. Um I don't get a lot of help from you know Yeah. I I know so. that, and you know and that I yeah. Police aren't as helpful as would like them to be. Uh do you think April knew uh or knows about Carlos's behavior. I guess where I'm going with this is, you know, she has this this guy friend who's over there that day. That, you know, she's showing off her new baby and everything. Um, do you think that April would want one of her friends like Zoe to be friendly with this guy Carlos if this guy has a not the greatest reputation? Does that ever come up in your mind? Oh, definitely. I I I I I often wonder whether or not she knows what kind of person he is and why would she have introduced them or, or, or anything. But her, 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 her thing is that she didn't know Zoe and Carlos were going to talk or that they were going to get together later on that night. I know that when I did talk to her, she did tell me, that um, the police, the detectives, have questioned her numerous times. Uh, several of them were videotaped. Um, so she said that that, and the only reason I know that she told me that is because she says that, you know, it really freaked her out. And you know, right. she's a she's a young mother of two kids, so you know, she was freaked out, scared. Okay. And I don't know if she's, you know, just, I don't, I, 
like I said, I hadn't seen her or talked or even heard about her in years, so I don't know exactly what kind of, you know, person that she became or anything. Okay. Just wondering. Um... The cops, eventually, uh, one of your detectives did take a dog over to Carlos's house. What did the dog smell? Uh, the cadaver dog uh, picked up her scent in his front yard, inside the home, alongside the outside of his house, because I guess there's a walkway between the house and a fence. And also picked a person in the alley. Well, and which would make sense being that Carlos admits that she's over there. But and mm-hmm. how long was this after Zoe disappeared? Um, two years. Wow. Two and a half years. Yes. I I, I didn't even know that cadaver dogs had went to the home I, okay. nobody ever told me that it it was wasn't until the child advocate that i had was the one that uh she found out two and a half years later a dog was able to still pick up zoe's scent over there that is well i don't know like when that the the dogs went to that home. Oh, okay. i didn't find out until two like two and a half years later Okay. Um, I guess what I'm asking uh, like is, when do you believe the dogs were taken very shortly after Zoe disappeared, or a week later, a month later? No idea. I I have no idea. Like, um, I, you know, I I don't want to sound like a mother who's not interested in finding I, out the facts or anything. It's just the police don't tell uh, you much. The police don't. They don't tell me. They haven't told, they don't tell me anything. And when I, if, if I do come across it, then that's when they admit to it. That, it, it right. if, if someone calls me, cause I still, I haven't gotten any in a while, but I still get people messaging me saying, look into this. And, you know, and, and I call my detective and he's like, Oh, well, we already did that. You know, whatever. Like I, I, it needs to be also said that I've, this is the third detective that I'm working with because they keep reassigning her case. Yeah. And I just think it's, it's outrageous. It's, it's, it's frustrating. I hear you, uh, Melinda, and I hear it um, from many of the cases that I cover. And my listeners are very smart. They know the predicament, although they don't know how. I mean, some of my listeners are my former guests, so they know exactly how you feel. But, of course, most of my listeners have never had something uh, like this happen to them. But now that they've heard it so much, uh, they know the reasons that you answer some of these questions the way you do. When you say, I don't know, the police don't tell me. My listeners, now maybe the people who watch Disappeared, maybe they don't understand. But my listeners, being that we do missing persons cases every week here, they understand exactly what you're saying, and I can tell you for sure uh, they have total respect for you, and they know that you're doing everything that you can. They understand that the police just aren't as helpful as you'd like them to be. They don't tell you much. Um, you go through many different detectives. Uh, my listeners understand that, so I don't want you to feel bad that you can't answer some of these questions. Please do not feel bad about that, okay? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> uh, my listeners, I definitely understand, and I'm sure my listeners understand as well. Okay. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that you personally, as a private citizen, you aren't part of the government. You're not a detective. You don't work for. The, you're not a police detective yourself. We understand you're doing everything that you can. Okay. And in fact, even having a private investigator who is out there, you know, trying to dig up some things for you. All right. Um, you know, they, the, you know, uh, we understand that the cops, they're under no obligation, unfortunately, tell me anything or the listeners anything or you anything uh, regarding this. Yeah, exactly. You know, and uh, the problem is that <laughs> I'm sure you've gotten the impression over the years that maybe they're not doing much. 
definitely and yeah. that they don't accept accept the help that comes their way i've actually i've 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 actually gone to different resources um asking if they will step into the case uh and with they they're always so quick to say okay yes but we have to talk because it's not their jurisdiction they have to talk to the detective and they have to get their permission and from what my understanding is is all the detectives that I have the three the two the two main ones um have denied the help You've also, not only all that, but you've also not been very pleased with how the police have portrayed Zoe in the media. Why don't you explain that? No. Um, the first um, press conference, I, I guess, that they had for Zoe, and this was probably a few weeks after she went missing, um, they expressed that, um, they said that, she would she was basically she was putting herself in dangerous situations so they portrayed her as pretty much a bad kid and that she put herself in dangerous situations that may have led up to her being missing and what they mean by that what all this stems from is just because she smoked weed. Right. There is, to your knowledge, and even to the police's knowledge, there's not anything else that Zoe was doing that um, would have brought her into uh, dangerous situations, just in, as an example. She wasn't a prostitute or anything like that, meeting strange men somewhere. She wasn't doing that. That would be something where, of course, is very dangerous. Of course, Zoe was not doing that. No, and... Uh, she didn't have, um, according, you know, later on when I find out from the detective, she had no affiliations with any gangs, mm -hmm. um, nothing like that. It was just on her social media that she smoked weed. About she it. liked to, to smoke weed right. and she would put it on there. It's not like she was selling it or distributing it or trafficking in it. She was just a user. She had no felonies on her record, no charges, anything like that. No, no, never mm. been in trouble with the law. Never. She was not selling it. Uh, she was not, you know, distributing it or whatever. She wasn't trafficking it in or, or bringing it in. No, she just, she knew a person that would sell it to her and she would buy uh they call it a dime bag. I guess it's like $10 worth and that would last her like a week and a half, two weeks tops. And then she would go and get another one. Once again, I, I mean, I can't deny that drugs do play a part in many of the disappearances I cover. Um, but in this case, it, it is, seems to me that the police did not treat um, her very fairly as to who she actually no. is. I think they no. really, really, really exaggerated um, Zoe and who she was, you know, if not exactly. out, just right lying about it. I, I believe my first detective, he never once asked me who Zoe was, mm -hmm. never, never wanted to find out who she was. All he was about was her social media, what she was saying on there. And then, of course, basically all he was saying was she was being she's she's probably being sold. So mm -hmm. it was never. They just it just seems like they didn't take the time to ask me about who she was. It wasn't until I started having interviews with the media uh, news and and even then a lot of it is is edited you know not everything that i say comes out and it's 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 
it's portions and you know, you can't really know her in about eight minutes or whatever. Even though the interview took 20, 30 minutes, they only air like eight minutes of it. And and, and don't get me wrong, I appreciate the media. I really do because they, they keep her face out there. But I just wish that at the beginning, everybody would have known who she really was. And at the beginning, I would have wished that my first detective would have taken the time to find out who she really was and, and, and to really work on her case. And we probably would have found out her outcome or, or, you know, found where she was or, or anything. I believe if they would have worked it the way they should have, I believe we would have found her within the first few weeks. A lot of uh, families feel the same way you do, Melinda, that um, they don't like it when they talk to the media and things get edited. They don't like it when they talk to the police and police blow them off. I hear that a lot. It doesn't just happen in Lubbock, Texas. I've covered another disappearance in Lubbock, Texas, the disappearance of Jennifer Wilkerson. Her mother, Vicki, uh, has a lot of the same complaints uh, about the Lubbock Police Department that you have and that you do. But I, I live here in Florida, happens here, happens in Pennsylvania, California. There's an overall very lax attitude in police departments toward missing persons cases. There's no denying it. it it's an epidemic. Um, the good news is that this uh, interview is uh, now over two hours, and none of it is getting edited. It's going to play just as it has. So you don't have to worry on Unfound. The interviews play exactly as they were recorded, Okay. So there's going Thank to be no you. editing. Mm-hmm. You know, every word that you've used is going to be heard by the listeners. Um, where does the case uh, stand at this point? Um, wh- let's put it this way. When was the last time you actually talked to somebody in the police department? Um, I talked to, I actually uh, called my detective um, a few days ago. Uh, um, probably no more than a week ago, uh, there was a tip going through. Um, someone called the a tip line, and uh, it was something that was created by uh, my child advocate and my private investigator. And a tip came in recently. Uh, it was an anonymous caller. He indicated that he he threw out a name, uh, said that this person was currently in the Lubbock County Jail, and that this person was uh, the one who ordered the abduction of Zoe, is exactly what was pretty much said on the, the, the voicemail. Um, ordered the abduction of, what does that mean? Um, I'm I'm thinking he ordered uh, for Zoe to get picked up or for Zoe to get taken or for something to happen to Zoe is what I'm interpreting this. Okay. Um, I did call my detective. I left a message. He called me back a few hours later, and I, I asked him had he heard about the tip. And he said, yes, uh, one of the, the people that were the, one of the, the child advocate that I had, had forwarded to him. Um, he says it's not, he believes it's not anything because the name has never come up in her, her case and that he's pretty much not going to look into it. I he, think he dismisses right now, it as just some just, rumor, just some talk, nothing serious. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not anything that they're going to pursue. Um, so they're just, that's where I stand right now. Like, I don't actually know if they're actually working on her case. Um, I do know <clears throat> they did put together a file on her case against 
Carlos and sent it up to the DAs to see if they had enough evidence to charge Carlos. And it came back that there was not enough evidence uh, to charge him with Zoe's disappearance. Yeah. Um, even after everything that has been put out there, I just feel like other than her body or him making a confession, I don't know how much more evidence or what else they would need. Um, I just think they're sitting and waiting to see if he's going to actually confess. And in the meantime, birthdays go by, her anniversary is coming up, and it's just, it, it, I said it before, it's just frustrating. Do you think that going back to this aunt that saw this guy run away from the car, uh, is there a possibility that that could have been Carlos? I mean, did she get an, a description? I know he was wearing a hoodie with uh, you know, the hood up over his head. Maybe he couldn't be seen. Uh, would you say that Carlos would match the general description of the guy who parked the car and ran away? I could say yes, but then that would, I mean, I, I don't know that that description fits any young kid, mm. you know, um, I, I've only seen Carlos on Facebook pictures. Um, I, so I, I don't really know what he looks like in person. Uh, I've seen one of his mug shots. Um, so I don't really know exactly what he looks. Okay. Like in person. And this, where this apartment complex, where this car was eventually ditched, is that close to where Carlos lived? No. Oh. No, that was probably from his home to the apartment. It was probably a good 10 to 15 minutes, maybe. All right. If that. Driving, that would be driving distance. It would be probably a lot longer right, walking right. distance. Right, right. So we, we have this guy that ran away, but just don't know if there will ever be a description of him that is good enough. Um, all we can say is that whoever ditched that car was able-bodied enough to sprint away from it. So that would mean some sort of younger guy, teenager mm -hmm. in his 20, maybe 30s. Um, frankly, just to be honest, it, it would seem that maybe we could rule out Ben, being that he's in his 50s, as a guy who would be able to maybe, you know, hustle away from a car like that. Um, so maybe yeah, that keeps yeah. him out of the picture. We just don't know. Um, yeah. How has this been for, I mean, I know it's been tough, but tell me about Zoe's dad and how Savannah has have reacted to this disappearance. Um, Zoe's dad, pretty much, um, he, he's, he's, a, he's military, so... Um, don't really, uh, see a lot of him. Um, I know that when Savannah talks to him, you know, like on her, you know, like on talks to him, uh, about like maybe her birthday or, you know, her anniversary, like he kind of shuts you down. Um, I know that his heart hurts. I know that it, it, it hurts for her. Um, just like it does for myself and Savannah. Zoe and Savannah were pretty much inseparable. I mean, they were best friends and sisters, and it, it's been hard on, on her because, you know, a lot of times she feels like she's lost her best friend, and, you know... Uh, for myself, you know, that's my baby girl. That's, right. that's my baby girl, and I miss her every day. Is there anywhere that uh, the listeners can find uh, more about Zoe? Of course, we know about the Disappeared episode, and I will be linking to that. I, find, I have a place online where people can watch it um, in, in the lead-up to this uh, episode playing, but do you have, like, a Facebook page, anything like that? She does have her own uh, Missing Zoe Campos Facebook page. Um, 
there was also an episode on crime crime watch um that's linked on her page as okay. well um I try to get back to uh, you know people who message me on her page as soon as I can um is you know there's there's still messages coming in from the show that aired uh on disappeared that people are just barely seeing like from South Africa or uh Italy you know okay. yeah uh, there are coming in messages are coming in and you know I try to respond as fast as I can uh I just recently took over her page uh I wasn't involved in her page uh I had someone create it and also manage it, but uh, here recently I'm the one that's taking over and and responding to messages as you know as fast as I can. Um, but okay. her page is is out there, and if anybody could share it, you know, the more the merrier. I mean, the better the to where her face will be out there more. Any last words before we complete this interview, Melinda? I just uh, want to thank you, of course, for for doing the interview. I uh, also want to thank anybody that's, li- that's going to listen to this. I know you have your, your viewers, your listeners, and I just want to thank them ahead of time and and just let everybody know that I really appreciate everybody's prayers and 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 thoughts and and um and if they could just keep her face out there and someone somewhere's got to know something and I'm hoping that it'll happen soon because this is just you know it's it's just really hard on us and. You know, we miss her every day. Melinda, uh, I can assure you that uh, we're going to continue to keep in touch uh, after this episode plays. All all of my guests know that I like to keep in touch with them after. I try to help them in any way I can. We brainstorm new ideas. Sometimes they just need somebody to talk to. Um, And so I want to tell you that this is just the beginning of us knowing each other, Melinda. All right, even though we've only known each other for about a month and this episode is, this episode is going to play, uh, we're going to know each other for a very long time. Okay, I can assure you that. And I want to continue to help you try to find out what happened to your daughter Zoe. Okay? Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. so much. You're welcome. And I appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. Thank you. You're welcome. And that was my interview with Melinda Campos, mother of Zoe Campos. I thank Melinda for joining me and all of you on the program. Zoe's case is the first one in Unfound's history where a victim called somebody she thought could help her, and the person doesn't remember the conversation. Not to mention that it doesn't seem like Ben could help her, because Zoe has been missing for four and a half years. He didn't come to her rescue, he didn't call the cops, He didn't even go back to the bar and tell Melinda, hey, Zoe's in a bad situation. Because those are things he wouldn't forget at the time. Yes, maybe he might not remember them the next day, but even in a drunken haze, would somebody like Ben be able to do something right then at like 1.45 in the morning? This is a question I ask you drinkers out there. What do you think? Having said that, I have to admit that I had to think long and hard about this summation before I wrote it. Lots of possibilities and permutations regarding the time between 1.30 a.m. when Zoe called Ben and 2.20 a.m. when Zoe texted her mother. And yes, I do believe Zoe, not Carlos, sent that text. Those 50 minutes are the key to this disappearance. And it's kind of like the Bermuda Triangle of this case, where a phone call was lost. We don't really know the topic of that conversation between Ben and Zoe. And before I go into some of my insights, I want to say this. This could be the kind of case we've all heard of, 
Boy tries to do something to girl. Girl resists. Something bad happens. Could easily be the case. But I can't help but think there's more to it. And it's because of the call to Ben Flores. So regarding the call from Zoe to Ben, you can go two ways with trying to decipher what the content of the call was. On one hand, you can take Melinda's position that Zoe was stalling for time. She called Ben as a way to figure out what she was going to do next because Zoe was afraid of Carlos and Zoe thought she had gotten herself into a bad situation, meaning Zoe called Ben for help. Totally plausible. And that Ben can't remember the conversation because he truly was drunk. Or maybe he even passed out after a couple minutes and Zoe stayed on the line as a way to continue to stall for time pretending to talk to Ben after he had passed out, but his phone continued to remain on. Once again, totally plausible. The issue, though, is this. Would Carlos really wait 30 minutes while Zoe talked on the phone? It's hard to imagine. We all know how we like it when we meet people, then they get on the phone with someone else. Even after just a few minutes, we're like, hey, that's rude. Well, Zoe talked for 30 minutes. Also, would Carlos not hear what Zoe was saying? Would he not realize she was fearful of him? And not to mention that if Zoe was truly worried, why didn't she just have Ben come get her? Or if he was that drunk, why didn't Zoe call Savannah or Jessica or 911? Why did she continue to stay on the phone with Ben in particular? It's hard to understand. The other possibility, possibility number two, is that Zoe called Ben pretending that he was her marijuana hookup, that she was once again stalling for time, but in a different kind of way. To me, this is more plausible, because I could see Carlos being patient with Zoe being on the phone because he would think he was getting something out of it himself, even if the call takes a half hour. Yet, then we run into another problem. Would Carlos really do something to Zoe if he thought she was going out to bring weed back? I mean, if Zoe could lie for a half hour on the phone, then all she had to do was lie for a few more minutes to get away from Carlos. Moreover, she could have said, come with me, Carlos, then driven straight back to her apartment and locked herself inside, all the while pretending her own apartment was the place she bought weed. So, we run into issues with the number two possibility of the content of the phone call as well. So, each of the speculations about the phone call have their strong points and their weak points. But probably the biggest issue with this case is that Carlos, Kim Cruz, and Ben don't know each other, but their stories kind of mesh up. This is a situation that continues to bother me. And it goes something like this. Zoe and Carlos do run out of weed, just like Carlos told the police. Zoe calls Ben, and they try to figure out where she can get more. Carlos wouldn't get upset at that kind of phone call because he would benefit from it. Zoe gets in her car while she's talking to Ben. He directs her to the Villa Motel where she is seen by Kim Cruz. Remember, she says she saw Zoe on the phone. This would also explain why Carlos isn't upset, because he's not even there for part of the conversation with Ben. This would also back up what Carlos said about Zoe going to get weed. While Zoe is waiting for the transaction to take place, she texts her mother thinking, well, I'm going to be out of here in a couple minutes, and maybe on my way home I could just pick my mother up on the way back to Carlos's. But something happens at the villa. This could also explain why Ben didn't pass the polygraph when asked if he knew what happened to Zoe. Not that he necessarily did anything to her, but he might have pointed her in a direction that put her into trouble at the motel. And it would also explain how a guy like Carlos who lived at home could hide a Lincoln for three days. How? Because he wasn't the guy who made Zoe disappear in the first place. Yep, I can't get that all out of my mind. New commentary. This was recorded January 10th, 2019. Although there is now a man in custody for the disappearances of Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman, those two girls still haven't been found, but I'm hopeful they will be. So technically, that case is still not totally resolved. 
So Zoe's case is the first in Unfound's history where, for the most part, everything has been resolved. Carlos Rodriguez has been charged, and Zoe's remains have been found and identified through DNA. This is the point that all of my guests desire to reach, although all of them hope their loved ones are still alive, despite the chances of that being very slim. Yet, in getting those answers, the resolution brings the worst in heartbreak. And I think this is what you've heard so many guests express over the last two plus years. They want answers. They want a resolution. Though, they are fearful of what those answers in that resolution might be. They don't know if they should be excited or subdued when remains are found. Hopeful or depressed when a new witness comes forward. Happy or sad when a new tip comes in. It has to be one of the most complex managing of emotions that a person can experience. And many of Unfound's guests have been doing this not just years, but decades. I can't imagine it. I've not spoken to Melinda since Zoe's remains were identified. I hope to at some point. And if she permits, I will pass her thoughts and feelings on to all of you. As for what we now believe happened to Zoe Campos... It seems at this point that her murder was exactly as it appeared. She went over to Carlos's house, something happened, and he killed her. Yet, I think many of us, including myself, slighted that possibility when this episode first aired. For the following reasons. Reasons that still aren't explained at this point. Number one, we believed Carlos lived with his family. Well, if so... How did he kill Zoe without them knowing? Was the information wrong? Did he actually live by himself at that house? Or did the rest of the family also live there, and they were part of the cover-up? Number two, the cops back in 2013 had looked over the entire property for signs of Zoe. They didn't find any. So we rejected the idea she had been buried there. But it now appears that's exactly what happened. How did the police miss the freshly dug grave five years ago? Number three, most importantly, at least in my mind, is the phone call Zoe made to Ben Flores. As was stated in the interview, he says he couldn't remember it, thus making him look very suspicious to many people, including myself. Well, was he an accomplice in this crime? Was that phone call actually made by Carlos and not Zoe? Or... Is Ben Flores totally innocent in this, and that half-hour call had nothing to do with what eventually happened to Zoe? Moreover, in talking to the police, has Carlos ever mentioned that call to Ben, whether by him or Zoe? We don't know, but I sure would like to. And number four, we can't forget the alleged sighting of Zoe at that motel the same night she disappeared. Was she really there, or is this another case of an eyewitness getting something wrong? Or to put it bluntly, just making something up. So, I still have questions. Will we get the answers to these questions? I don't know. Yes, the answers won't bring Zoe back. But they would help us, I believe, as we continue to examine and try to solve all the other missing persons cases out there. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.